Here we have a specimen of a right scapula. Note that this is a very flat, triangular bone, and we're looking at the anterior surface of the scapula. The scapula has a fairly prominent medial border, as well as a lateral border, and these two borders come and unite at the inferior angle. Superiorly, the scapula has some prominent bony uh, projections. The first one is the coracoid process, which is seen here. It's a beak-like projection, and hence the name coracoid, which suggests a raven's or a crow's beak. Here we see the glenoid cavity, which is a rather shallow cavity, which articulates with the head of the humerus to form the glenohumeral joint, or the shoulder joint proper. If I rotate the scapula around, we see the posterior surface of the scapula, and we see this prominent bony ledge known as the spine of the scapula. The spine of the scapula extends laterally to form the acromion process over here, which is overhanging the glenoid cavity. The spine of the scapula divides the posterior surface into two parts, an upper or superior smaller component known as the supraspinous fossa, and a much larger infraspinous fossa below the spine of the scapula. Next, we will consider some of the muscles that attach to the scapula, and we'll begin by looking at the muscles that make up the rotator cuff. There are four muscles. The first one is known as the subscapularis, and it is seated in this area of the scapula on its anterior surface. The fibers of the subscapularis muscle go laterally and attach onto the humerus, specifically the lesser tubercle of the humerus. The other three muscles of the rotator cuff can be seen from a posterior vantage point. The muscle which is situated in the supraspinous fossa is the supraspinatus muscle, and the fibers of this muscle cross the glenohumeral joint and are attached onto the greater tuberosity of the humerus. The third muscle is below or inferior to the spine of the scapula and is known as infraspinatus. This is a large muscle, and its fibers also cross the glenohumeral joint and are attached onto the greater tuberosity of the humerus. The fourth and final muscle from the rotator cuff series is a small muscle known as the teres minor, which is attached in this area, and its fibers also cross the glenohumeral joint and are attached onto the greater tuberosity of the humerus. There are several other muscles that are attached onto the scapula that do not participate in the rotator cuff. On the anterior side, we would see a muscle on the medial border here known as the serratus anterior muscle. This muscle attaches on its other end to the first or the top eight ribs and participates in rotational movements of the scapula. There are several muscles that we would see from a posterior vantage point. On the medial border, going from a superior to inferior direction, we would find the muscles that stabilize the scapula, and they are called the levator scapulae, which would be attached here, the rhomboid minor, which would be attached here at the place where the root of the spine of the scapula is situated, and then the rhomboid major, which would be situated along here on the medial border of the scapula. There would be one other muscle that would be seen more laterally, and it would be attached onto this area on the posterior inferior part of the scapula known as the teres major. And this muscle also goes laterally and has its attachment onto the proximal humerus. And then finally, we have a muscle that has a very small attachment, but it's a large muscle, the latissimus dorsi, which is attached here onto the inferior angle of the scapula and it makes its way also onto the proximal part of the humerus. So those are some of the muscles that find attachment onto the scapula. I started off the description by saying this is the right scapula, and we can now confirm uh, that uh, side, whether it's the right or left, by looking at the features. So we know this is the anterior part of the scapula because the posterior part of the scapula has a ridge known as the spine of the scapula, and when we look at the anterior surface of the scapula, we know that the glenoid cavity needs to face laterally. So this is the glenoid cavity, and it must be facing laterally. So if this is the anterior surface, this is facing laterally. The only other thing we need to know is which is superior and which is inferior, and clearly these bony projections are superior, and this is the inferior angle. 
And so if we know all of those features, this can only be the right scapula. Here we have the clavicle bone. Note that it is a lazy S-shaped bone, and it has a flat end, which is seen here on this side, and a very rounded end seen over here. The rounded end is the medial end of the clavicle, which has this extension which articulates with the sternum, whereas the lateral end is flattened and it articulates with the acromion process. And because this is the lateral end that I'm holding and this is the medial end, we also know that this convexity faces anteriorly, which is because the clavicle is convex in its more medial aspect and the concavity facing anteriorly is seen in the lateral side. So this is the clavicle of the right side, and the lateral end of the clavicle articulates with the acromion process of the scapula as seen here. So this is the acromion process of the right scapula, and the right end of the clavicle is articulating with the acromion process as seen here. In this situation, note that there is a roughly a U-shaped appearance around the spine of the scapula on its external border and also the lateral border of the acromion that extends then onto the lateral side of the clavicle on its, on its anterior aspect. Similarly, there is another U that is formed by the inner side of the spine of the scapula and the acromion process and this extends on to the posterior part of the lateral end of the clavicle. There are important bony, uh, important muscular attachments on both of these U-shaped areas of bony attachment. The one that is around the inner side is the site of attachment for the trapezius muscle. And the outer U, which is seen around here, is the site of attachment for the deltoid muscle. If we turn the clavicle around, we can see the inferior surface of the clavicle over here. In contrast to the superior surface, which is very flat, the inferior surface has some bony ridges and a projection seen here. It's also got some roughened uh, areas of the bone more laterally. This bony projection is a site for some ligament ligaments that attach it to the underlying coracoid process in its normal articulation as seen here. One can Imagine where the ligaments might extend between the undersurface of the clavicle and the coracoid process. Here we have a right humerus, which is the single bone of the arm. We're looking at the proximal or superior end of the humerus, which continues down as the shaft. And then finally, we have the distal end here that participates in the elbow joint. Let's begin by looking at the details of the proximal end, which articulates with the scapula seen here. This is the hemispherical head of the humerus. Note its smooth, curved surface, and it articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula as seen here. The head of the humerus is attached to the remainder of the bone at what is known as the anatomical neck of the humerus, which I'm pointing out here, and this runs circumferentially all the way around, and all the way around till we got back to the point we started off with, which is the anatomical neck of the humerus. If we continue down more distally, we find two bony projections. One is here, and then the other one is here. The larger one is known as the greater tuberosity. The smaller one, and the one that's more medial, is known as the lesser tuberosity. And in between the two, the two tuberosities, we have a groove, which is known as the intertubercular groove. And there are important structures that go through this intertubercular groove. Uh, from the area of the shoulder joint and into the arm. Once we go a little bit more distal to the tuberosities, this uh, area of the bone becomes narrowed and it continues down as the shaft. At this point, this area here that I'm pointing out now circumferentially, and I'll rotate this all the way around, this area that I'm pointing out is now is known as the surgical neck of the humerus. And it has some very important clinical significance because of the blood vessels that are in this location as well as some important nerves. If we look at the glenohumeral joint uh, in its anatomical uh, orientation here, note that the greater tuberosity, which is here, 
hits against the undersurface of the acromion as the humerus abducts. And this is uh, one of the reasons for cause of shoulder pain because of what is known as impingement and compression or irritation of some of the soft tissues that sit in this area, such as components of the rotator cuff.